We have three speakers this morning. And the first is Edward Shin, Edwin Shin, excuse me, Eddie Shin, as we, most of us know him. He is going to be talking about uh, building to scale, which is, of course, inter of interest to all of us. So, Eddie? Can everyone hear me? All right. Well, so I got a little bit of an intro from Carol, but I guess I'll just do a little bit more. Um, so I'm managing partner at Media Shelf. Um, I'm actually ex NSDL and ex Fedora Commons, so actually an ex colleague of Carol's. Um, I'm also a Fedora and Hydra committer. Um, so I share either praise or blame uh, for the resource index. Uh, messaging module, Fedora client, and uh, most recently this uh, Sword version 2 for Fedora to at least some degree. Um, and I'm also the release manager for the upcoming Fedora 3.6, um, which I think Chris will be talking about at his plenary uh, later this week. So I'm going to discuss some of the recent challenges we faced um, building some repository applications uh, just in the last eight months. Uh, with content ranging from millions to hundreds of millions of objects. Um, so I'll also talk about and describe some of the, I mean, very different strategies uh, that we had to employ to sort of meet this um, high volume of read requests versus uh, high volume of write requests, um, as well as um, some practical limitations that uh, we ran into around preservation goals when you're faced with um, sort of such large volumes of data um, that are accompanied by high availability requirements. Um, so earlier this year, I'm never sure if I'm allowed to talk about who I'm doing the work for now. So anyway, Christian's right here. So it, for DTU, um, we worked with DTU to develop a blacklight application against a corpus of about 250 million documents. And so as far as I'm aware, this is by at least an order of magnitude uh, the largest solar index backing a blacklight application. Um, and so although the initial ingest was enormous, um, even a pretty naive solar deployment could index the 250 million records in just a couple of days. Um, however, once you start tweaking the uh, indexing configuration to sort of meet the functional query requirements, um, then you suddenly start to see the indexing performance plummet to unacceptable levels. Um, and then on the, on the, on the more in interesting side, actually, I think, is once you actually try to meet the reasonable query performance requirements or thresholds, uh, then you get into even more elaborate uh, tuning and configuration. And so I'll go into a little bit of that. Um, I just have up here on the slide that you know we started with all this data staged in Postgres. It was coming out of a, a different system that DT already had. Um, the average size of the records was about a K. Um, and this is, I, I point this out because um, certainly when we did some research on this up front, um, you know, there's a, there's a great document out there. I mean, it's, it's a number of years old by I think the Hadi Trust about their solar index and sort of the problems they ran into and what they had to do to scale. And they were only at 10 million. And uh, so we were kind of alarmed about um, <laughs> hitting 250. And it turns out, I mean, they're doing full text indexing. Um, so they had much bigger solar documents. And so, well, this will be a sort of a recurring theme of it, it re you really have to know what you're working with uh, <laughs> before you make your decisions. Um, so we had the pleasure of working with some very nice kit. Um, three servers, each with 12 physical cores, 100 gigs of RAM on each server, uh, each with access to a terabyte SAN volume, all running uh, Debian Linux. Um, so just this week, actually, because I wanted to have sort of harder numbers for you guys to present as sort of benchmarks and charts and pretty graphs, um, we actually um, brought all that Postgres data over onto EC2. And um, well, A, it took a really long time just to transfer 80 gigabytes compressed um, First time we did it, we didn't realize how highly compressed it was, so we ran out of EBS volume. Then it took forever to actually do the ingest into Postgres. And the solar index is still running, so I don't have any query, hard query numbers. I can just sort of report um, sort of our more uh, sort of casual um, observations that we made 
but I don't have actually charts and graphs for the solar stuff for you today. Um, one of the things we saw with the indexing, with that sort of naive attempt, was that you know that first 100,000 records, if constant, seemed to suggest we could get through all 250 million um, in 18 hours. So, you know, good things don't quite ever pan out like that. Um, so we, we found out that the index performance fell off pretty dramatically after just a million records. Um, and so what we ended up doing to sort of tweak this was, I mean, just as first steps, and these were sort of general steps that were sort of before we uh, really did any examination of the, the data that we were working with, but you know, we had 100 gigs of RAM on these servers, so we took some advantage of that, right? Um, we gave 30, 32 gigabytes of heat to the JVM. One of the things we did know, we did know coming into this beforehand was, I mean, certainly for solar, is RAM has a lot more bang for buck than um, <coughs> CPU. Um, we also switched to Java 7. So we, given that we were assigning such a, a, a relatively large heap, um, the Java 7 G1 garbage collector uh, versus the concurrent mark and sweep collector that comes with Java 6 uh, was far better performance. Um, sort of a simple, simple thing was just doing the documents in batches rather than one-offs. But I think the most important was that we stopped forcing commits. And um, actually, we turned on auto commit in solar um, at every one million documents. And I mean, the reason this was the most important, I think, was because running a commit blocks solar from receiving um, any new documents. And so for further gains, we could have actually just only done the commit at the end of the job, but we sort of like having a little bit of progress along the way, which is why we set it that way. Um, and so we ended up being able to index 250 million uh, documents according to the index configuration that we wanted, um, you know, to support the, query, the queries that we wanted um, in two and a half days. And as we don't expect full re-indexing to be sort of a, an everyday occurrence, we were pretty happy with that, and, and we, we basically wanted to move on to uh, the sort of bigger and, and juicier problem of, of, of querying. So what we had to work with was five facets, um, format, journal, author, year, and keywords, and um, seven queryable fields. And Right away, we saw a worst case query performance uh, that was greater than a minute to return a response. I think it was actually something like 77 seconds when we were benching it at the time, um, which is pretty terrible. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't <laughs> wait for that. Um, so a couple easy, obvious optimizations to do. Um, one is actually run optimize on your solar index. Um, that had the incidental benefit of reducing our index size from 112 gigabytes uh, to just 6.2 gigabytes. Uh, that only took about an hour to run. Um, and the thing, what that does is, you know, so that reduces the number of your extent files. So it makes searching faster, although it doesn't make um, inserting any faster. Um, then to warm up the solar caches. So that ensures that the caches are actually populated um, when the first request arrives. Um, we added new searcher, first searcher event handlers, um, but queries were still too slow. So then we started looking at sharding configurations, and we did a lot of different sharding permutations. Um, gosh, we did, I think, multiple shards per servlet container, like per Tomcat. We did multiple shards per JVM, multiple shards per server. And what we ended up settling on is what, we have, what I have up there, which is 12 shards across two servers, um, three Tomcat instances per server, each with two shards. And so, um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with sharding. I mean, we do some of this. I mean, you do some of this with your databases, but um, in solar, it's basically you get to divide up your index into chunks, and um, solar is very good about letting you sort of um, query against a whole set of, uh, of shards. Um, and so already we saw our worst case query drop from 77 seconds to eight seconds um, with these optimizations. So eight seconds is still really not pretty, uh, is, is pretty unacceptable though for client response time. So um, we actually ended up going through some of the statistics that Solar uh, kind of kindly provides to you. Um, and uh, we noticed that the filter cache uh, had a pretty low hit rate, uh, just 15%. And so that meant the cache was too small, right? It meant that, um, in fact, that the cache was missing most of the time. and um, when we actually started looking at our data, um, well, we saw it was, pretty, it was pretty clear that the multitude of um, 
unique values for the keywords field um, was causing the problem, or the keywords facet was causing the problem. And so each shard was managing about um, 3 million unique values in this one field. And so, um, you know, if you we, we basically had, we hadn't changed the default value. Um, it was still 512 for the max size of the cache. Ideally, you'd actually bump it to 3 million to match uh, the filters by facet. Um, but each of those slots takes some memory. And uh, so whoever here might have thought that, you know, 100 gigs should be enough for anyone. Um, well, it's not. Um, <laughs> And so, but since we were running six shards, shards on the machine, that meant six times the memory. So we compromised and raised that max value to about 40,000. And we found that now our worst case queries had dropped to less than two seconds. And in fact, for the vast majority, they were actually in the 10 to hundreds of milliseconds. So that was a, a pretty happy ending for us as far as um, the tweaks we had to do to get um, Solar to um, cope with such a large data set. Um, the sort of takeaway though was there wasn't any, I mean, there wasn't sort of blanket things that we could have done. Um, I mean, there's, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of general optimizations you can do, but really getting to the performance that was actually acceptable really required taking a pretty good look at the kind of data you're doing, really looking at how it's being used and, you know, um, doing a fair amount of testing and tweaking. So, um, Recently, we built a uh, Hydra application for a pretty modestly sized corpus of about 600,000 um, objects. Um, but this repository was expected to increase significantly over time. And ingests, in particular, could be expected to come in pretty big chunks, like 100, 150,000 object chunks. Um, and so we needed to, you know, be able to process those ingests pretty quickly without actually without interfering with the read performance of the repository. So, um, <laughs> so we deployed a queuing system with a variable number of workers. And uh, so, for people who know Redis and Rescue, that's what we were that's what we were using. Um, and so to maximize ingest performance, we would vary the amount of workers based on sort of uh, idle, idle um, periods. And you know, so we'd run fewer during the active periods. Um, but it became pretty evident pretty quickly that <coughs> in this case, that Fedora was the bottleneck for ingest performance. Um, and in our case also, the ingest bottleneck was exacerbated by the fact that we were creating our Fedora objects programmatically. Um, that is, you know, by, via a series of API requests, like, you know, ingest a blank object, add, the, add a data stream, add another data stream, you know, do an update, do an update, um, rather than building up a Foxmill document up front and then just doing a single ingest request. Um, and although, so the latter approach certainly would have given us performance gains, it would have done so at sort of the expense of code complexity, uh, maintenance, you know, maintenance down the road and sort of decreased flexibility um, in our application that ultimately you know, we, we deemed was insufficient to warrant the, the trade-off. So while we noticed, you know, solar, for instance, performed quite well and certainly wasn't a bottleneck um, on the ingest side, we noticed that we were getting um, data corruption and errors in Fedora when we configured between 12 and um, 15 concurrent uh, worker threads. Um, they would manifest as these sort of can't find the object exceptions or um, and those might, at the root, be we, we ended up look, ex poking around the file system, and we'd find these sort of truncated Foxmill files that were, you know, like one one byte long. And um, what was pretty troublesome is that we could semi-regularly replicate this in staging when we were, you know, staging a big ingest, um, but we could never get a test case that would sort of actually manifest it. Um, and I, I couldn't even get it, I couldn't even replicate it, um, you know, sort of doing a multi-thread JMeter load test either. So we never did get to the bottom of it in sort of the time we had to sort of deal with this. So um, what we ended up doing as a workaround, largely, was to shard Fedora. Sort of given our, our recent success with sharding solar, or working with the sharded solar um, for DTU, we thought about doing this for Fedora. Now, Fedora doesn't support sharding um, natively. Um, so if you're going to do sharding without sort of hacking on Fedora, you do it outside of Fedora, sort of unbeknownst to Fedora. Um, 
And so what we did was, um, so for those of you who are familiar with you know, the Hydra stack and with Active Fedora, which is a, a Ruby library there that sort of mediates access to Fedora, um, we basically implemented sharding at this library layer um, outside of Fedora. And it just uses a very simple hashing um, algorithm to sort of distribute objects across however many shards you decide to configure. Um, and so in our case, uh, we started with just two shards. And so we just told Active Fedora that we've got two fedoras running, one running here, one running there. Um, each fedora thinks of itself as the only fedora in the world, uh, doesn't know about the other. Um, and we're, just us we're using an algorithm that's pretty similar to what Fedora uses internally for how it distributes files across the file system, just uh, doing an MD5 on the identifier. And in this case, we do a modulo, depending on the number of shards you have. And so we get, at least on average, a pretty even distribution of objects across um, the Fedora repositories you have configured. So um, this allowed us to roughly double our ingest performance with negligible impact on reads. Um, so I think this is an interesting strategy for us to sort of pursue in the Fedora community to see if it's something, something like this is something we should actually see about building into the core. Um, I'd actually like to figure out what the original error was. <laughs> but, um, you know, if wishes were, well, anyway. Um, so, um, I don't know how I am for time here. Um, okay. So, um, this was a pretty big project um, that I was doing at the end of last year. It, was, it had the following requirements. A Fedora-based repository service to support 20 million digital objects with a read-only transaction volume uh, averaging between 10 and 30 transactions per second 24-7. Um, the service had to be designed for high availability, disaster recovery. Reads on the repository were basically should never be interrupted, whereas an interruption on the ingest service um, could be for up to a 24-hour period. Um, and moreover, that this whole deployment architecture had to support the ability to upgrade the repository platform, like namely upgrade Fedora, um, without a service interruption. So individually, <laughs> any one of these requirements was a, is a significant challenge and combined sort of like the stuff of repository manager nightmares. Um, and um, so the traditional um, high availability approach in Fedora is to use Fedora's journaling module. Right, so what this does is the, the, you, your Fedora repository captures all requests that have anything to do that modify the repository, writes it out to a journal file, and that gets read into a, a, a following uh, Fedora instance, which basically replays that uh, transaction. So something like, here's your Fedora master or leader, there's your follower, if you were to do an ingest here, writes to a log file, gets replayed there, and you can do it with n followers, right? You can have as many followers as you want. Um, so for strengths of journaling, it's proven. Um, this was developed by the National Science Digital Library years ago. Uh, it's been battle tested in production for years and years. It's conceptually simple, and it's a straightforward design. I think, you know, it, it's, it's um, I mean, basically every single follower is a full redundant node, right? Um, that's one of journaling's weaknesses is that every follower is a full redundant node, right? So every follower adds a multiplier to your storage, software license, hardware costs. Um, because every transaction gets replayed, every follower adds a multiplier to your network traffic. So if you're pushing around really big objects, this is, this is a pain. Um, similarly, if you've got an ingest operation, for example, that maybe triggers a computationally expensive operation, you're going to repeat that computationally expensive operation on all of your nodes. And for this pro project, this actually was one of the specific problems, that they have this ingest that happens every week or two weeks that takes something like hours to basically process and does, gen does all this inferencing and generates all this new data. So you do that on the master, takes a couple hours, then you pipe that over here, and now your follower nodes, which are in this case would be what's servicing your read requests, are going to be at least hours behind the master. <coughs> um, maybe another fairly significant difference is, or, or issue is that journaling assumes that you know Fedora is sort of the center of your universe, that your your repository application is in fact driven, all of its state is driven in, um, by Fedora. Um, so all of the indexes should be derived from that from the, your repository. 
Now, if Fedora just happens to be a part of a larger application where an, another piece is maintaining state, now you have this problem of how do you ensure consistency? Um, maybe I need to zoom through some of this then. Um, this, is, this is sort of the scenario that we, we knew wouldn't work. We actually tried to do journal, we tried to model how you would do journaling um, and also maintain separate application state by passing around this transaction object. Um, basically, uh, I hope you would all cringe if you sort of think about uh, what that actually means you're trying to do. Um, what we actually ended up going for was a fairly uh, novel approach. Um, we were relying on the fact that you could have a shared file system um, on the left. So the top and the bottom are basically mirrors. So really what I'm talking about, on, on the left you've got that master uh, uh, read-write node. There's a shared file system and two read-only nodes on the right that are have a read-only database that's not using journaling, but it's actually using, in this case, Oracle's uh, database replication. But we actually proof, uh, did a proof of concept of this on AWS just using Postgres and NFS. And you can, with a little bit of uh, adventuresome sort of configuration and tweaking, you can actually get a, a pretty high performance read scenario going on. Um, and in this case, scale up, I mean, n nodes on the right, um, and potentially um, not have to deal with the sort of con consistency issues, data consistency issues that you might get uh, if you are doing journaling plus other applications that have to maintain state. Um, I'll try to do this one really quick then because this is sort of the punches that, I mean, so really the thing with the scale here is that once you're at 20 million objects, um, you know, backups, upgrades, especially an upgrade that requires a rebuild of Fedora, um, and certainly disaster recovery become a real issue. Um, I mean, the typical preservation argument for Fedora is that, oh, you can always rebuild Fedora, right, if you have the object in data stream stores. And that, but that sort of argument rings a little hollow when you're facing potentially weeks or months of downtime in a disaster recovery scenario. So we had a pretty hard look at the contents of a repository and the kinds of access that people needed. And it turns out, so in this particular repository, there's 50 years of historical data. Almost all of the requests are for the current year. So if you could actually, in a disaster recovery scenario, plan to only rebuild and bring up the current year's worth of material, I mean, you can do that in potentially less than a 24-hour period and be serving you know, better than 80% of your, of your user demand. Um, this required a bit of finagling to change how we actually store data in Fedora, the algorithm that Fedora uses to distribute files in the file system. But I think I'm out of time, but um, I code's up on GitHub. I I'm happy to talk to people more about this. But um, I guess this is sort of a repetition of the moral that a lot of this could only happen and you could only get to scale um, by really understanding what's in your repository, how it needs to be used, and, uh, and then some creative work around that. I'll give you Hydra t-shirts later. <laughs> oh, it's just the, the G1 uh, garbage collector that comes with Java 7. Yeah. What's up, Jonathan? I uploaded them to the conference website. Yeah, all the, all the slides that will be available. Ben? Uh, Netflix run a process called Chaos Monkey, which has privileges to all its servers, and it randomly turns ones off. <laughs> um, it's to train the programming team to deal with high availability when things are just dying randomly, and it will kill random processes. Right. And that's a neat idea, I think. That's a does. great idea. Yeah. I have not played with it, and I have yet to find a client who would probably let me play with that. But yeah. <laughs> let's, let's thank Eddie again. Um, at the end of the session, we may have a few more minutes for some additional <laughs> questions.
We may have time for another question after all while we set up for the next presentation. So if any, Eddie's right there. So if you have any other questions, just feel free to press them. Oh, I didn't realize you have to use your Sorry for the delay, I didn't realize you have to use your own computer. <laughs> Our next speaker is Shirley in Crompton, and she's from STFC in the UK. She's going to be talking about inter-repository linking of research objects with web tracks. Shirley, a bit of technical hip hop here, sorry. Shirley. Anyway? Okay, sorry, we're set. Um, first of all, I um, do I do I use this one? Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah, page time. I think you can just advance. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's it. Thank you. Sorry. Um, first of all, I want to give some background information on um, sorry, STFC and about the Web Tracks project because. Um, this talk is about what we've done in web checks. Um, SDFC is a research funder. We uh, fund scientists to come and use our large facilities. Um, like ISIS, my colleague already has already covered it uh, and uh, told you that they produce a huge amount of data every year. And our group, the scientific computing, um, develops and maintains the facilities e-infrastructure to support the um, uh, facility uh, experimental operation. The infrastructure includes different um, systems like uh, the facility ICAT data catalogs, which manage and uh, facilitate access to the experimental data. And e-publications, which is um, inst an institutional archive, which um, hold the research outputs of the SDFC staff and also the research users. Our group also um, participate in research in uh, data management and preservation, as well as infrastructure building. And here are some of the projects that we participate in. Now, WebTracks is a joint collaboration between Southampton University 
and our group. It is funded by the JISC Managing Research Data Program to develop an approach and mechanism to propagate structured citation links to restore context um, to dispersed online digital research objects. And the project built on prior work um, by Claudia and Stalling, which investigated the citation linking in the research sector. Now, this is the issue that we are tackling. Science on the web increasingly involves the use of diverse types of applications and data services. In a generic scientific uh, process, this may involve using an electronic lab look book <laughs> to document the experiment and also um, running experiment in the in research facilities like ours. And in the process, the scientist may also use and create different types of research outputs, like um, raw data from the experiments and um, analyzing the raw data to produce refined data, and finally producing a digital um, data model of the molecule or protein and writing up the public uh, results uh, and in uh, peer-reviewed articles, etc. Now, as these research objects are dispersed in separate systems under different administration, this often leads to information silos. When this happens, um, we when this happened. Um, we lose a coherent view of the research process as the relations between these dispersed objects are buried in human readable but not machine readable contents. This impedes the tracking and accessing the research outputs. Linked data provides a mechanism for publishing and connecting structured information on the web. The linked data best practices recommend using RDF to describe resources and how they relate to each other, and using addressable HTTP URIs as resource names so that they can be accessed on the web. Now, using RDF, we can annotate the relationship between the research objects in our example scientific process and lock the context in to create a linked data web. So far, so good. But the research objects may be created um, and deposited using different systems and at different stages of the research process. So we also need a mechanism to actually construct and propagate these links um, uh, between the dispersed objects. Now, if we allow the repositories to communicate, we can progressively build up a link web of research objects to support um, research. For instance, for the scientists who are mostly content users, this will um, help improve access and facilitate discovery and subsequent reuse of um, research related objects and allow them to track dispersed research outputs that they themselves produced to prevent misplacements and obsolences. obsolence. For the assessors or the reviewers, um, citation links capture the provenance lineage and facilitate validation of uh, the claims in the published work. Now, for the content providers, um, it will help increase exposure of the holdings via link in from um, external contents. And conversely, um, could help augment their own contents um, while linked to related objects outside their repository. Now, there are existing citation protocols that support the intelligent pushing of links between repositories, <laughs> targeting specific application environments. For example, trackback is used in the blogosphere to track dispersed conversations. Semantic pingback uses RDF to describe citation like web tracks, or it adopts the RPC protocol rather than the HTTP protocol as championed by link data. And then there are Claudia and Storlink, which provide an um, underpinning to the web tracks development. And in particular, this work um, highlighted the requirement for a lightweight peer-to-peer -peer protocol 
that does, that does not rely on a central service mm -hmm. as independent repos repositories in the research sector prefer not to rely on third party serv services because their resources are usually limited. Now, in web tracks, we uh, took a two pronged approach to um, re address the issue. We um, provide the intercom protocol to facilitate the link propagation and a restless application to help fast track um, custom implementation of the protocol. Intercom is a general purpose HTTP based protocol which makes use of the emergent link data environment of using HTTP URIs as resource name. For example, we use permalink, we can use permalink or DOI and um, use RDF to describe the resource, provide metadata, and also um, uh, describe the, uh, the relationship between the two resources. Um, the intercom does not constrain the choice of vocabulary to describe either the metadata or the link. So with a judicial choice of vocabulary and term, it is possible to um, represent a backward and forward link as illustrated in the slide. And intercom is a two-stage protocol, like a track back. Um, first of all, it involves the harvesting of the target resources uh, metadata and discover among the metadata the intercom ping endpoint, which is then used in the second stage for um, posting the RDF link request. Um, the WebTrack's Java application is an open source release built on the rest that framework. It can be extended using the rich features provided by the uh, framework to integrate um, appropriately with the um, underlying host application to both on support for intercom. To build a custom implementation, the implementers needs to implement um, three main classes. Um, this is the middle tier in the diagram. Um, first of all, the um, uh, data facade class, which uh, support the application interactions with the um, backend persistent storage layer. And the, the intercom application class, which um, provide common services that um, make up the operational features of the application. Now, um, an imp implementation can um, leverage the existing REST components of proxy or even implement their own the custom filter to um, uh, deliver the um, security policy as required by the repository. Um, for instance, there's so many different policies um, in stalling, um, they use white list to prevent spammings, and um, in the um, semantic ping back, they retrieve and inspect the source, uh, the request link source, to actually verify whether it's a genuine request. And in the and um, oh, what is that one? Uh, and in Salmon, they uh, use a signed security, they sign the request with a security token to make sure it cannot be uh, forged. Um, lastly, what you have to implement is the um, resource class to uh, wrap the digital research objects that you want to expose to link requests as a restless resource. Um, WebTrax uh, uses a resource oriented approach that exposes digital objects as addressable resources. Instead of using a single receiver endpoint to process all the link requests for the whole repository, the uh, web tracks we abstract this functionality into the link container resource object, which is um, the child object of the um, actual resource. Now, as the links are first class objects on the web, they can be accessed and manipulated directly via HTTP methods. For instance, subject to the host's um, business policy, a specific link may be removed using the HTTP delete method on the links. Now, to test drive our products, we implemented two examples, one for ICAT and one for EPOPs. And in lines with the info model, 
we expose the investigation DOI object and a subordinate link container object, which, as mentioned before, acts as the receiver for the parent investigation object. And in line with um, link data principle, we um, provide um, both human and machine readable versions of these resources. And with EPUBs, similarly, we expose an expression object and a subordinate link container object. And um, using a test driver, we send link requests to the two separate uh, applications. As you can see in this slide here, we can kind of do a follow your nose type simple navigation to um, access the link resource directly on the web. Maybe you can see um, item A is the intercom endpoint for that particular ICAT DOI object, which um, as mentioned before, um, is also the links um, resource object on its own, in, on, in its own right. And um, if you get an HTML representation of this links resource object, you can see a tabulated list of the uh, published list associated with this parent ICAT um, DOI object. And uh, item B in the links resource is actually pointing, uh, is the U HTTP URI pointing to the ICAT, sorry, the EPUB's expression resource, which is part of this link. And an HTML representation of the um, expression resource um, um, gives you information about that. And, and as in the ICAD DOI resource, it also contained um, um, the metadata about the intercom pink endpoint, about its own intercom pink endpoint, which is item C. And if we retrieve um, HTML representation of that links object, we again get a tabulated list of the links related to the expression object. And in there, we have a reverse link, which allow us, which points back to the original ICAT DOI object. Um, so now um, using our test driver, um, we're able to demonstrate the post hoc processing of citation notification, that is, after a resource has been deposited. And these two archives actually generally represent opposing ends of a research process, the um, initial experiment generating um, raw data to the final um, to uh, write-up of the analysis and the um, publications, but in between, there are various outputs that need to be tracked in order to capture a comprehensive view of a piece of research. So um, the SRF project is investigating this particular issue. It is um, developing an integrated set of services to automate the um, prescriptive scientific workflow, including the in-process capture of provenance information so that the scientist can just concentrate on the more innovative aspect of the um, research, which is like analyzing the data. And in the SRF use case, um, web tracks will be used, will be triggered during the uh, research workflow to establish citation link in context. And in this particular example, um, web tracks is used to um, create citation links between the uh, derived data uh, um, uh, produced from analyzing the raw data. And this particular use is um, the in-process capture of citation contrast with um, the um, previous example of um, uh, creating citation link as and when required. Now, to summarize, web tracks provides a simple but versatile mechanism to propagate citation links and track dispersed um, output, research outputs between a loosely coupled federation of research archives. These semantically, these semantically annotated links 
form a graph of citation and provenance, which can be analyzed and traversed. Um, it is this potential to um, aggregate um, diverse research um, objects according to specific query parameters in order to um, produce or to um, pro to produce research containers to support a variety of applications. For example, um, packaging the different uh, types of um, research outputs to facility exchange and reuse, or um, as evidential basis, sorry, no, as evidential basis to support others and mate in academic publications, for example, to facilitate journal review, etc. Thank you. And uh, if you want to learn more, there's some <coughs> links on there. And um, if you have any questions. Science at Cornell University. Um, he's now at Cornell University Library. He's going to be talking about uh, resource sync, web based resource synchronization. promising. So in contrast to the previous talks where the presenters talked about some really hard work they've done, I'm going to spend some time talking about a lot of talking that we've done and uh, the hope of producing something that will be useful. So I'm going to talk about a project called Resourcing, the aim of which is to produce a protocol, a specification for synchronizing web resources. Sounds almost trivial, doesn't it? Um, while I am talking, this is the work of a large number of people. Um, there's a core team that put in an application to the Sloan Foundation to get funding for this, which includes uh, many people who've been involved with OAI work before from uh, Los, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Old Dominion, Cornell, and also folks from NISO. Um, We've had a bunch of meetings so far. There was a call for participation at the CNI meeting, and we have recruited a bunch of additional team members, including folks from the UK, Richard Jones, Stuart Lewis, Graham Klein, uh, funded through JISC, uh, and a number of other participants from other organizations um, who've been involved in, in meetings since then. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge funding from the Sloan Foundation and from JISC, and I'd like to acknowledge stolen slides from Stuart Lewis and Herbert. But now it's all my fault. So, synchronize what? Even web resources perhaps deserves a little explanation here. Pretty much all of us involved in this like to work in the open world. We, we like to use the web because we're about sharing things openly. But on the other hand, while we talk about web resources, we don't limit ourselves to web resources that are openly available. They might be closed ones with all the usual mechanisms for authentication, authorization that happen on the web. Um, one of the beauties of the web stack, of course, is you can focus on one place of this and allow other parts of the stack to do other bits. Um, web resources, things with a URI that can be dereferenced and are cacheable. Hidden in that 
is something about support for a different representations content negotiation. We have, after some discussion, thought that we would not try to create something which supports multiple representations hidden behind a single URI, but everything will work fine provided your content negotiated resources are, have specific URIs and are therefore identifiable in that way. We chose the web as the place to work because we wanted to be producing something that's independent of the underlying technologies. One of the things we're trying to get away from is specific solutions to synchronization based on my Unix file system, my Fedora repository, or something like that. We hope to produce something which scales from something very small, which can be done at low barrier. I have a small website. I want somebody to be able to copy that, perhaps for a preservation use case, perhaps to replicate it. I have a very small repository. I've just unpacked my shrink wrap ePrints and put a few things in there. I don't want to have to hire a developer to be able to allow people to copy this content and reuse it. Also, up to something which is very large, either in the terms of the number of resources or the sizes of those resources. So, you know, we've had Eddie talking about 20 million items in a Fedora repository. Maybe someone else has 100 items, but they happen to be large data sets. And then there's the spectrum of change. A lot of what we do within this forum is talk about institutional repositories where perhaps people submit a paper, you know, they put out four a year and they're considered pretty good, so the repository the institution might have a few new things every day. Or we might have a linked data set where we're changing every second or so. And perhaps there's a spectrum of use cases where it's okay to synchronize every month to get the latest copy, or we want to build something on this derived data set that's pretty fresh. We want it you know, within a few seconds. So there's a latency spectrum here. And although our sort of application area is research communication and cultural heritage, heritage organizations, we're trying to produce something that's general, that works well with the web that's out there, not something that's in a, a closed little box. So the real answer to why are we doing this is because all the people involved with this have had needs to synchronize data between systems and have basically had to roll their own each time. Los Alamos has experience with the memento aggregator for the International Preservation Consortium. Europeana, for example, does OAI metadata harvesting but anticipates needing to harvest full content. At Archive, we have a mirroring application done homebrew and we like to share data for which we currently put things out on S3. There are people trying to build on, on top of linked data now, which often requires a copy of that linked data locally to meet the sort of service requirements for speed and what have you to build services. So a number of us have experience with OAI PMH, which is pretty wildly, widely used, but doesn't quite fit the bill. First off, it was scoped for XML metadata only. And second, it was done in 1999. No one had even talked about REST in 1999. You know, the web has moved on a little bit, and we felt the need to update it. And we really hope to produce something which will work for data, metadata, and linked data, all, of course, which exist on the web. So thanks to Stuart for some really wonderful pictures. We've sort of spent a bunch of time enumerating some use cases, which I'll just skim through rather casually here. Here are pretty basic things, you know, one thing copied to another thing. Master copied many places, someone aggregating. What if I want to get part of a repository, a selective synchronization? Then we get a bit more sort of interesting pictorially. Uh, XML metadata harvesting, that's the OAI use case. Large data files begs the question, how do I do an efficient update? Is there a mechanism for diff, for example? Uh, protected resources, how do you handle something that's hidden behind an authentication barrier and allow a client to understand that in a meaningful way? Uh, what if I don't actually need to synchronize the resources? I just want to collect statistics about what the resources are. So we had a lot of discussions, and those use cases are things that we considered basically in scope. Um, we have another, uh, another set of use cases which we thought are out of scope, and I'll just go through some things which we aren't aiming to cover in the first iteration. First, bidirectional bi synchronization, things changing at two places, trying to sync that up. One can, of course, try to do that with a unidirectional protocol, but there's a lot of, lot of subtlety to it. There's a, a lot of interest in, in this for sort of desktop applications. 
Um, query over which things I want to synchronize. Destination defined selective synchronization is my long word for that. Um, we don't want to get into the business of merging a search and a synchronization. Special understanding of complex objects. Of course, you can represent a complex object as many resources, and you can have, say, an ORE resource map to link them together. We can synchronize all those resources, including the description. That's fine. But we're not trying to build something which has a special built-in understanding of, oh, this collection of resources within the larger set is a complex resource. At the moment, we have not considered in depth the notion of diffs, although we understand this will be important for large data objects. We anticipate some sort of hook for this, but the problem with the diff is that there's no media non-specific way of doing diff. You know, I can use diff, do a diff algorithm on a text file, and that will work fine. It won't work on a video file. You need something more subtle. And in general, it depends on the media type. Um, I won't talk about the last two anymore. So a couple of real life use cases we played with, and I'll talk about a little bit more. What if I want to duplicate the DBpedia live link data set that's generated from Wikipedia? We've got about 20 million entries, and the update rate averages out at about one a second. I want to build an application on top of it that's sort of in sync with the web out there, so I want low latency. This basically tells us that we're going to need some sort of push technology to support that. We can't have a bunch of clients polling at many times a second. It's going to collapse. And then perhaps a more mundane use case, closer to uh, the repository community. I happen to work with Archive. We have about a million article versions. About 800 a day are created or updated. Metadata and full text for each. So we've got you know, 16, 1,700 things a day. And at 8 PM US Eastern time, new ones come out. It's pretty important that our mirrors and anyone using us have stuff has an accurate copy, but otherwise the bandwidth and latency requirements are pretty easy to achieve. What we'd really like is a low barrier for other people to get this stuff to make a copy for either their research or a derived product. And we want a more general solution than our current homebrew solution of publishing a manifest in a funny format that's actually been working really nicely since about 1994, but is custom to us. And then, just because we're not sure we've really got a good copy, maybe there was a problem, we do an rsync every now and again. And of course, that's specific to a particular authentication regime and a particular Unix file system layout. We want to get away from that. So just so that I speak with the consistent language, I'll go through a little terminology. I'm going to talk about a resource, by which I mean web resource, item of interest to be synchronized. The source, the server which has the master copies of all these things that I want to copy from. A destination, the place I want to synchronize to. And I can either have my destination poll and pull, give me your stuff, or I can have the source say, here's my fire hose of updates. Grab them if you can, and I need some fabric then to support that transport. And I'm going to use the term metadata to mean the information about these resources necessary for synchronization. They're web resources. They have a URI. They probably have a modification time, a, a digest or checksum. And don't confuse that with resources that may themselves be metadata about other resources, you know, a Dublin core record or something like that. In terms of understanding the problem, I think this is the most important slide here. We believe there are three basic needs to be met to deal with the synchronization problem. The first, baseline synchronization. A destination has to be able to get its first copy of the data from a source. It might be the initial load, the first, the first contact. And we don't really want to have to have someone, uh, excuse me, uh, Rob, can I uh, get a copy of your uh, IPC data? You know, we'd like some sort of discovery mechanism so that if the stuff is openly available, we don't have to have any out of bound email or phone or whatever. So then I've got my initial copy, and on some schedule, I'd like to get updates in that incremental synchronization. Obviously, 
different requirements for latency, and the minimal set of operations here, I need to be able to get new things, update things I already have a copy of that have changed, or delete things that have vanished. Those who happen to be intimately familiar with our IPMH will notice a little issue with delete and the history of sets there. Um, and then finally, how do I know that the copy I have now is in sync with the source? Audit. Again, if the source is changing rapidly, audit will only be so accurate. You know, if the source changes every second and the process of checking takes 20 seconds, then perhaps there's some allowable error which I can understand if I, if I have the right method. And we'd really like this to be more efficient than doing a head request on every one of the resources, which would be sort of the pure web way of doing this with no additional support. So two approaches to baseline synchronization. I either get an inventory of all the objects and then do a get on each one, or perhaps I can optimize this by getting a dump of all the resources and metadata in one lump. I obviously reduce the number of round trips there, particularly useful if the objects are small. Audit. So of course, at any point, if I want to know I have an up-to-date copy, I could just do the whole copy again, right? And then I would have assured that I hadn't missed any updates. But perhaps that's not particularly efficient. We imagine the archive case, you just copied uh, a million articles instead of the 800 that were updated. So perhaps what I can do, and here we learn from age-old but very useful technologies like rsync, I get an inventory from the source, and I compare it with my local copy. And you know there are questions about how much metadata about all these objects, a timestamp, a digest, size, for example. One could extend the list. There's obviously a choice here between the effort it takes to support this and the accuracy I can have in assuring that I have an up-to-date copy. And once again, I already mentioned the notion that the, there's a latency issue. If the updates are very frequent, we might be saying, yes, we did the audit. It's up-to-date within x seconds or something like that. And then the middle one, incremental synchronization, you can sort of break this down and think about it in a number of ways, but we've been thinking about it in this way. Obviously, you can do incremental synchronization based on your audit. You can do an audit, find out what's not in sync, and then copy the things that are in sync. But perhaps we can optimize that. Perhaps we can exchange, instead of a complete inventory, we can exchange a chain set, listing only the updates. Um, and then. Obviously, when we know what's changed, we've got to somehow synchronize the content. We could do that either by going back to a set of get requests on the things that have changed, well, at least the things that have been created and updated. Perhaps we don't need to do that on the deleted ones. Um, or we could optimize this by providing a dump for the change set. So we've got a one file for the whole set of things that have changed, along with all the information that says which resources they are. And one further wrinkle, which I'm not going to talk about more, is the notion of change memory. If I want to be able to provide a destination with not only the current state, but perhaps the ability to find out all intermediate steps, I might need to provide some sort of memory of when these changes happen, because perhaps one resource has gone through three versions or something like that. So we've come up with this template to try and think about how technologies fit into this picture. So we sort of divided the, the vertical bars. We've got baseline, incremental synchronization, audit. And the incremental has some, some subtleties around pull, push, and how much memory there is. And then there's the exchange of just the metadata about resources and the resources themselves. So then we spent a bunch of time looking at little ovals. Uh, no, evaluating technologies and trying to think what might work for us. And you know, approaches, push and pull up there, basically concluded that for simplicity, we would like there to be a pull way to do this, but some applications will require a push to get the latency they need. Up in the uh, top left, there's some sort of technologies for reference, but not serious contenders. And then there's a lot of things we thought about for parts of this, really with the hope of inventing as little new as possible. And we ended up settling on perhaps the simplest of them all, which is how can we leverage sitemaps? 
you know, a way to tell Google what on your website they should harvest. Well, that's an inventory. So what we've come up with is a framework that starts out based on a sitemap. It's very modular in the sense that you can deploy different components of it and there are no dependencies on doing the whole sequence. So you could do just the baseline sync. You could, in fact, do just the notification if you wanted. Um, add things to that, like tagging within the sitemap to allow selective synchronization based on sets defined by the source, and discovery capabilities by adding atom link elements to link, say, change sets together and things like that. Now, I'm just going to go through a couple of these boxes. So simplest one, baseline synchronization, pull of the metadata. And this is really, I think, a really not neat part. Level zero, the base level of this, is publish a sitemap and someone can grab all your resources. It's sort of trivially simple. So sitemap has a bunch of elements in it. Each describes a resource, and minimally that is a location, a URI, and a last modification date. Um, we suggest extensions to convey fixity, size, tags, and one can provide extensions in the sitemap, again, to, to link together different uh, parts of the framework. So a simple sitemap for two resources. It really is extraordinarily simple. Uh, I've given two URIs, each with the last modification time. If I wanted to synchronize with this rather boring website, I might grab this every now and again and get things if they've changed or something's been added or deleted. Uh, the source might, for example, extend this by telling me the size and a, a digest for each of these resources. So I could not only trust the last modification date, I could compare it with my local copy and see if it really has got the same digest. And the bottom one, for example, I've said this is tag frogs. You know, we don't know what frogs means, but it's tagged frogs. If you have some understanding, then you could use that. So the sitemap format was designed to allow extension. It's a very simple format, explicitly says, fine to put other elements in there so we're not breaking anything by adding things. There's an issue with the size. A manifest might get quite large. Sitemap has a mechanism for a sort of two-level structure where there's an index of 50,000 different sitemaps, which gives you, I think, 2.5 billion resources before we'd need to extend that further. And Although we haven't got an application in mind which would require that, it's clearly not hard to think how you would do that. And probably by the time we'd want to, Google would have done anyway. We had some discussion about what this might mean in the world of RDF. Should we try and make the XML look like the RDF structure we imagine the meaning of this to have? And the conclusion at the moment is no. We should understand how one would represent the same information in RDF, provide a mapping, but not try to muddy the representation in XML with the semantics of RDF. So the next box along, a change set. We want to do an incremental sync on a site that's perhaps got more items than two. Um, we provide another sitemap periodically, which looks pretty much the same, apart from the fact it only includes information about the resources that have changed. Same location and last mod elements. Some indication of the event type. Optional hook to provide an ID for the event, perhaps linking into more data. And potential extensions to include, say, links to a memento time gate if you want to be able to provide explicit links to every version of resource. You know, the sort of hook into other infrastructure which might provide greater functionality. And notions of linking between these change sets, so you have a sequence of chain, change sets that a uh, client could follow. So just to sort of see what this feels like, I built an inventory and a change set for archive. So I want to synchronize about 2.3 million resources for archive, it's 300 gigs. Following the limitations of uh, 50,000 items in a sitemap, that ends up as 46 sitemaps and one index, which is about 78 megabytes total if you zip. So it's not completely trivial, but it's certainly not a problem for lots of people to be grabbing this on a, say, daily schedule or something. Incremental synchronization, as I said, we have about 
a thousand additions and 700 updates in a day, that means that if I say wrote out a change set every day and provided the chain of those for someone to follow, they'd have to download 20 kilobytes to then find out the changes from archive, which all seems very, very straightforward and implementable. Now let's look for a moment at the slightly sort of harder case. What if I want to have a push notification so I can deal with much faster update rates? We have, after consideration of a few technologies, settled on XMPP um, as the best candidate technology for push. This is the same technology that's used in Facebook chat, Google chat, and such. Um, if you had to implement it from scratch, it would be a pretty heavyweight thing to do, but you don't. There are libraries, existing infrastructure out there, used in the much larger web than we exist in, that we can leverage. So what this provides for is a very rapid notification of change events via, to any client subscribed to the XMPP feed. We wrap the very same metadata, in fact, the URL element taken from the sitemap within XMPP's item container, and as a way of grouping a set of those in one notification, if you wish. And uh, voila, something that fits very neatly within the same framework. At Los Alamos, they did a fairly significant experiment using XMPP to synchronize a copy of the LiveDBpedia site. Um, so, you know, as I said, 20 million items, a change a second. They ran this to two remote sites, one synchronized with the whole set, another synchronized with part of it, and monitored the queue of changes in the remote sites, monitored the number of changes, and at the end of the day, did an audit. There were a couple of problems with some of the URL structures, but I think once that was removed, there was a discovery that after running, did I say how many updates? No, I didn't. Uh, oh, yes, 100,000 updates, things worked pretty well. They did get occasional glitches, which I think underlines the need in any of these process relying on <laughs> updates for a ability to check an audit. But otherwise, very successful. And then the one thing I haven't talked about, and perhaps have left to last because we haven't really quite decided, a dump format's necessary, but which is the best dump format? The two top contenders at the moment are just make a zip file and include that sitemap in it to describe the manifest of things and what they correspond to. Obviously, it's something to say which file corresponds to which URI. And this, you know, everyone uses zip, and you have a consistent format for the inventory. The only thing that feels a little awkward here is it would be a custom solution to link the file in the zip to the, the URI associated with. The other option is WARC, a uh, web archiving format, which is designed for exactly this purpose, <laughs> but is used by a rather smaller community. Um, there's uh, discussion within our, our group about what the best option is, and my current bet would be we might end up providing hooks for both because they seem to serve different communities. So. If I have another half hour, I'll go through and No, maybe not. <laughs> um, we've thought out how this works in all the other boxes as well. Um, and I don't have time to talk about that. But I'll talk about the overall timeline. So real soon now, a rather extended and more concrete version of what I've said will be distributed. And throughout the rest of the summer, There'll be people like me trying to tell everyone who'll listen, look, it's out here. Please give us some feedback about it. And in the fall, I guess I have become American, uh, we'll revise this, do some more experiments, and ask for more feedback. And hopefully, toward the end of the year, come up with something that we think can be finalized. There's information, and I guess this that's a link on the slide, which will be up very shortly, on the NISO web space. And we've done a bunch of experiments, and the code's up on GitHub. Um, and I'd love to speak to you in the rest of this conference. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Simeon? 
I must have offended somebody. So it all depends how you do it, right? So with the software that's up on GitHub, I, I did I built a client that looks very much like rsync, but does it for this. So I can run that against a copy of archive that's sitting on my local machine, and it you know runs through all those files, calculates checksums completely fresh each time, and takes an hour or so to run for all the items to make that full inventory. But if I were deploying this on archive for real, I'm not going to be as dumb as that. I'm going to look internally at what's changed or something. So I did it the dumb way because I wanted to check that the dumb way would work. But it seems pretty straightforward to make that much more efficient. If Archive, if you were, say, running over a Fedora repository, of course, you've already got all this metadata about all the objects. So you can just query against the triple store, you know, what are the MD5s, the, file name, the URIs, and everything of all these things that are changed? And that's how you can produce your change set or your first dump. So, yeah. Is that? Yes, um, we considered for a while providing really explicit support for multiple representations of a resource from a single URI, and eventually concluded that it was, one, not the best way to do <laughs> multiple representations, though we can't fix that for the rest of the world. And secondly, it, it's, it gets really fuzzy, because you, know, you can content negotiate and say, OK, well, we could. Uh, yeah, we could tag this representation with the URI and the MIME type, but that's only one of the many types of content negotiation you might do. So essentially, we ruled that out of scope. If someone does content negotiation where they do a 303 to a more specific URI, that works fine. You use the specific URIs within the framework. But we essentially concluded that the, the other problem of, oh, I've hidden multiple representations and really haven't given them separate URIs was basically out of scope. If you have a magic way to do that, I'd be really interested to hear, but I don't think there's a good way. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? I second that. <laughs> if there are no more questions, um, I'd like to thank all three of our speakers today, and um, it's time to pop.